Hello everyone, I'm Ben. I am the location pastor at the River Church Davison. Uh, thanks so much for checking out one of our messages today. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you to Pastor Josh for allowing me to be here. Um, it is good to be. I've spoken here like started 30 years ago. So some of you have known me for 30 years. And I've known you for 30 years. And what that means is I'm old. <laughs> right? It, but it is always good to be back here. Um, it's Dr. Johnson or just Doc. I'm one of the pastors. My office is in the Holly location, but I bounce around a little bit. Like next week, I'm speaking in Davison. And so it's exciting to get to see a lot of people and a lot of uh, newer friends and also friends from, let's just say, decades. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are starting a new series um, today that's going to go throughout the summer. You probably have a pretty good idea what the topic is by the bumper video, right? The book of? Proverbs. So Pastor Josh Combs, who's our lead pastor and our uh, location pastor in Goodrich, and his wife Jen wrote the whole book. And it's a topical study through the book of Proverbs. I never caught how many of the verses they used of Proverbs, but it's the majority of the book. And so this week we'll start off with the Lord Next week, we'll go into fathers. On Mother's Day, we're probably going to talk about mothers. Well, you guys, you, you get the idea of this, don't you, okay? And so, um, but that is, this is a book, you, it's a hardcover. You can get it on Amazon, but um, we have them at guest services back there in the corner for their, their $20. But again, a hardcover book going throughout the summer. Read through at your own pace. I think the first three chapters are on the Lord. Um, but then... We're encouraging you for the next four months to read through the book of Proverbs four times. Take a chapter a day. Maybe do something different. Why don't you try possibly four different translations? And so uh, we often use the ESV. Um, maybe go back with your, for me, like a King James Version. And so uh, just different translations as we go through just to get a feel for um, the passage. Now, I realize some of the months don't have 31 days, so on the 30th day, you might have to read two chapters of the Bible. But um, it, it, is, it, is, it is a good thing to do. I believe, for those of you who receive the devotions by text or email, you're going to be getting a chapter of Proverbs each day. And that was the plan. So, uh, it's an exciting study. Um, quite the project they took on in their free time of writing a book, but um, they've been working on this for a couple years, so um, I'd like to go ahead and, and pray. Father, it's good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I thank you for the message you've been working on my heart, and I pray that I'd be able to clearly communicate it. We thank you for the book of Proverbs, and just on um, how to have eternal life, and then how to have a blessed life by you. We thank you for the practical instruction that applies for today. Thank you for being here with us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've already confessed that I'm old. So a little bit ago when I turned 60, my wife said, what do you want to do for your birthday? And it was a Tuesday, and she had taken a vacation day, so I took a vacation day, and we celebrated at the Detroit Zoo. That's, I'm either 6 or 60, right? Because <laughs> I get excited about the zoo. We enjoy the zoo. We love going through. There are certain exhibits she lets me know that we're not going to. We just avoid some of them. But although we are a dog family, 
if that makes sense to some of you, our dog family, we love the big cats. And so going to see some of those big cats and going to those exhibits that are huge exhibits, but of course when you're seeing that mammoth animal go across and all the muscles in that, you always want to see the little cubs, right? You got to see the little babies and stuff like that and, and just enjoy them. And so we, we, we love doing that kind of thing. We moved to Auburn Hills just over 30 years ago from Cadillac, Michigan. And, um, and again, for us, anything past the Jesus sign is up north, right? <laughs> anybody, with, anybody raised that way with me also? Okay. And so um, we lived up in Cadillac for five and a half years. Coming down to Auburn Hills, we had some property with um, woods in the back that was connected to more woods. And when our son was seven, our daughter was four, came running to me and they said, there's a bear in the backyard. Now, that could happen in Cadillac. We had a neighbor go out into their garden to shoo away a dog on a foggy day and then take off running, <laughs> you know, because it was a bear. And so they understood that that could be something we have to watch out for with the woods, but we're like, Auburn Hills, a bear? So we contact authorities and, um, and the DNR. And I'm, but before I did that, I went in the backyard and saw a print, a paw print that was so big. And then when I went to step down, it went deeper than me. So I knew it was more than 125 pounds. <laughs> you can laugh a little bit there, right? But not too much. But um, so I knew it had to be a larger animal, right? And so while I'm still there, my neighbor comes over. We're looking at this. We're following these prints. And we're like, it doesn't seem like a bear print. An investigator comes. Well, what's funny about that is we're on the phone and mentioned this. They kind of mocked us on the phone, like, yeah, Auburn Hills, a bear. Yeah, your, your kids are just pranking you, which is very possible. And so within minutes, though, an investigator's there. And we're like, what, what is this all about? He goes, well, here's the prints. And he goes, yeah, there's, I'm like, you can't tell me there's nothing. There's no dog that's going to have this kind of print, right? And then we know what a horse is going to be, right? So you're talking that kind of neighborhood, right? But he said, well, actually, there's a panther on the loose in the area. I'm like, pardon? <laughs> now, I was surprised that this would be an area of bear. Panther, I didn't think that was something to our area. And um, he said, what happens is people get these exotic pets, when they're young and cute, and then they, you know, they could tickle them and hug them and feed them a little bottle, that kind of thing, and then eventually they get larger. And at some point, they're so large, they just release them or they escape. As I go into this topic of the Lord... I want you to pause for a moment and just think about your view of the Lord. Is he that cute, cuddly little cub that you get to tickle? I mean, I thought about, do I wear my t-shirt today? I do not have this t-shirt. I'm mocking it, okay? Let's see, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, it's like this mindset we have of bringing God to our level. Maybe we're trying to be up at God's level. And I, and I know I could go into a whole message today and go 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Very true. God is love. And then Romans 8, 38, 39, I could, I could bring this next. Josh, you know you'd love doing this, wouldn't you? I mean, this is, this is right there. For, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I mean, God loves us. Yes. And then I'd probably give some kind of follow-up with my message of going to like Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you would feel so cozy, wouldn't you? And you come out of here with some warm fuzzies and feel so good. I'm not going there today. <laughs> I want to, and we need a balance with this. 
I, I want to, yes, God loves us. God loves us so much he sent his son. But as soon as I get into seven verses in the book of the Proverbs, chapter one, verse seven, it talks about a fear of the Lord. And, and I think that's the balance with this. You, you have that cub, but I, I also, when I'm at the zoo, I like barriers. <laughs> I, I don't want, I mean, yeah, I would love to go to South Africa and visit a couple of our, our missionaries who are down there and go on a safari and see these animals up close from a distance with the vehicle running, right? It's, it's the motor's still going. We're not turning it off and see if it starts again. I've seen that in too many movies. I, I, I want to enjoy, but the sense of awe and fear Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The word fear is used 21 times in the book of Proverbs. I know I'm not going into a popular sermon topic. I understand that. But if you would stay with me for the next half hour on this and just see what Scripture says, let's listen to Scripture. I'm not taking away from the love of God. I just want to change our thinking a little bit. The love of God comes out of a fear for God. A fear of God does not come out of the love of God. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean as we go through scripture. The Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon says that this word fear in Proverbs 1 7 is terror and reverence. And I see the, the both sides there, that, that dread, terror, but to stand in awe and respect. Matthew Henry has a commentary that was written over 100 years ago that I love to use. He says, of all things that are to be known, this is most evident, that God is to be feared, to be reverenced, served, and worshipped. Peter Lang in his commentary on the Holy Scriptures says, verse 7 is not to be regarded as part of the subscription, superscription. It's not part of like the preface of the book. It's not like the intro of the book saying what's going to happen. He says, but it is the general proposition introduced in the series of didactic discourses that follows. It's a motto. I think we would say it's, it's your thesis statement. It is what the whole book is about, is the fear of the Lord. That everything else builds off of this. Jim Neuheiser, in opening up Proverbs, says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in the same way in which a foundation is the beginning of a house. Everything that comes after the foundation is built upon it. By the way, are you trying to confuse guest speakers by changing the decor of the place? It sure is looking nice, by the way, isn't it? But we know it's all built off the foundation. That's what he's saying about this book. This book is built off the foundation of the fear of the Lord. It's, it's the given that we start with, and everything else comes from there. The fear of the Lord brings the mercy, grace, and love. Alan Ross in the Expositor's Bible Commentary says, the Hebrew word for fear captures both aspects of shrinking back in fear and of drawing close in awe. It's going to be hard to explain that, right? How do I shrink back by drawing close? It's that, that whole sense of, of realizing who God is. You know that song, I can only imagine, when I finally see Christ? Yeah, I know I'm on my knees. I'm, I'm falling down. I'm, I'm not, there's no way I'm standing. It, 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 to, to see who Christ is. As I was going through this, I started thinking about I read this when I was reading a, um, a Jewish book about Genesis. And he was talking about that if you go through each of the early sins through Genesis, they're all based on pride. And, and we know that eating of the fruit was on pride. And, and he, just, he starts going on, but he mentioned with Cain, the problem being pride is the Jewish mindset. And he said that 
King could have believed that he was the Messiah. That even Adam and Eve are told that you're going to have coming from you is going to come the Messiah, the one who will say, he may have thought it was him. And so when it came to his offering, now what's the difference between a gift and an offering? A, a gift we, we, we give to one another, you, you may give this a gift you know, to, to someone who works for you, works with you, but an offering always implies I'm giving something to someone greater. And do we remember that God is greater? It's not just a gift. It's an interesting way to think through the story of Cain and Abel was Cain's frustration is that his gift was not received, but he didn't view it as giving an offering. In Exodus 20, 20, we read, Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. I was first looking at this, I'm, I'm like, he's saying, do not fear so that you can fear. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I get that. So I started looking through the verse more and more. And the concept was, this first part of do not fear, is do not fear that God is reckless. If I go back to the tiger analogy, I, I mean, people have TV shows now about these tigers, right? And they have their pets, and they'll have their private zoos and all these kinds of things. And then you watch some of the workers are missing limbs and things, right? It's just, it, God is not reckless. God is not unpredictable. He is true to his nature. He will always be true to his nature. You don't have to worry, is he going to be truthful or lying? He, he's, he's truth. He's love. I, I, matter of fact, I don't think it's just with like the large cats in the cat family. These household cats are unpredictable. The ones laughing are probably the ones who own cats. Is that fair? The other ones don't realize it yet. That's why you don't own a cat. Is that fair too? Okay. Um, He's, he's not reckless. So we're not fearful like, a, oh, what's he going to do now? But it's of that awe. Matter of fact, the Message Bible, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, says, Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid. God has come to test you and instill a deep and reverent awe within you so you won't sin. I think too often we have this view of the Bible as don't do this, don't do that, don't, don't, don't. It's almost like the diets I'm, I read about. They might as well just summarize the diet for me saying, if it tastes good, don't eat it. And we have that view of the Bible, like the Bible's just to wreck my life. I want to go through some verses right now in Proverbs, about 12 of them, that talk about the fear of the Lord. But as the fear of the Lord, I want you to think through with each verse, is he talking about providing for me or protecting me? Because that's the way of view, viewing this book. The, the Bible is, is God's, what does it say, basic instructions before leaving earth would, would be the acronym kind of thing that some have used. It's God showing us on how we should live. So we have a life that's provided with blessing and protected from a lot of evil. So Proverbs 19, 23, and I'm going to go through these pretty quickly, so you know, fasten your seatbelt, and here we go. Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. He's providing life. He's providing rest that's satisfied. To be able to sleep at night saying, I, I haven't, there's nothing where I've done something, someone wrong. The fear of the Lord has led me into righteousness, and I can, I can be at peace of knowing that God is in control. My life has purpose, value, meaning, a calling. And I won't be visited by harm. He's protecting me from that. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil are perverted speech I hate. He's just telling, he's letting you know what he hates. 
that he's not going to tolerate. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those of us who are looking for direction, for insight, he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord belongs life. But the years of the wicked will be short, providing life, protecting us from that other. Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. I started thinking through that verse a little bit more. By the fear of the Lord, I have strong confidence. Because from that Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. It doesn't stop there, does it? To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's basically, those who are loving God and called according to his purpose, is that the fear of the Lord? And I can have strong confidence because I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And so I can be confident in knowing he's going to take care of the situation. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Do you enjoy fountains? I, I just love watching a fountain and just seeing the things. Our, our daughter's getting married in June, and it's going to be in a garden setting. There's fountains, and hopefully I won't be preoccupied in watching them. But um, that one may turn away from the snares of death, protecting us from death, a fountain of life. Proverbs 15, 16, better is a little with fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. The book of Proverbs is a father talking to a son, a teacher talking to a student. And he's saying, I, I, I want you... It, it's, he's not talking about morality. He's talking about, I want you to have a relationship with the Lord. I want you to have a daily walk with God. And I will tell you, it, it's better than great treasure. You, you can't put a price on being able to have a walk with God. Proverbs 15, The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor the fear of the Lord, that, that wisdom, we've talked about humility, and then what comes? Honor from him. Proverbs 16, 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away for evil. And that's where the fear of the Lord brings the iniquity forgiven and taken away. Are you getting the concept that maybe the book of Proverbs has something to say about the fear of the Lord? Are we there a little bit? How about Proverbs 22, 4? The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. I mean, how beautiful does that sound? Proverbs 23, 17. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all day long. I know there's a number of you here who already have that fear of the Lord. You have that healthy respect, love for the Lord of knowing he is almighty. He is God, and I am not. <laughs> That's the only basic we need in life, right? <laughs> he is God, I am not. He loves me? Wow. And the mercy and grace involved there is amazing. How about Proverbs 3? You may have heard these verses before. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Who's heard that before? Oh, look at the hands go up here. Wow. You've heard that one. Why not go into verse 7 also? Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. We, we all pray about, you know, trust the Lord and he's going to direct you. He's telling you how he directed. Fear him. That's where the direction comes. Fear the Lord. Have a, have a fear of the Lord. That's where the instruction comes. So I was going through this, and I'm like, where else does it talk about a fear of the Lord? And I realized a number of the authors in Scripture talk about fear of the Lord. It wasn't just Solomon and the writers of Proverbs, but Job, which would be the time of Abraham, says in Job 28, 28, and he said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil's understanding. Moses in Deuteronomy 10 says, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, to keep his commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Very interesting. What's he requiring us? To fear the Lord 
And then comes love and service. But it starts off with a healthy respect of who God is. Later on in chapter 10, it says, You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Starts off with a fear of the Lord, then leads to serving, and your love comes. But you have this fear because you've seen these great and terrifying things. And, and what great and terrifying things would the Israelites have seen? And we can go through that with the book of Exodus. And again, he's talking about uh, so many things there with the plagues and, and how involved he was in their lives. In Joshua 24, Joshua writes his closing comments after leading the people. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Fear the Lord, serve the Lord. Samuel, in 1 Samuel 12, verse 14, If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. And that fear the Lord, it will be well. Later in verse 24, he says, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Are you getting the concept that maybe Scripture talks about fear of the Lord? I, again, I could do the same thing with the love of the Lord and the love of God and God's love for us. And I, and I would, yeah, would start, start me with John 3, 16, right? And I went to 1 John 4. And I could do that with the love of God, but I think we need to have this balance. And our culture today, I think, has, has, has really messed it up. Be, because we, with this prosperity gospel, of this, that God owes us one. We, we've been elevating ourselves to, to be like God. Boy, that's how I think everything started off in a bad place. You'll be like God. I'm not going to be like God. I, and, you, and you don't have to agree with me on that. You won't either. <laughs> but I'll, I'll never be like God. I can't be like God. I'm not promised to be like God. The promise comes that I'll be able to be with God in heaven because of the work of Jesus Christ. 2 Samuel 23.3, speaking with David, the God of Israel has spoken, the rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. And it's a beautiful picture in we really get to see it often with our winters when the sun comes out, even though it may be going to be a horrible day. But, you know, it's later in the day and we're driving to work or whatever, and boom, that sun pops out. And sometimes it's like blinding for us, right? If you're, if you're driving east and you're like, whoa, you know, put the shades down, put sunglasses on, even though there's snow everywhere. And you just, that sun comes, he says, that's what, you're going to be like that brightness that comes out with a fear, of God. So Solomon wrote most of Proverbs, but he also, I believe, wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is a book on finding the meaning of life. And he ends up taking three times where he talks about the fear of the Lord. Ecclesiastes 5 7, for when dreams increase and the words grow many, there's vanity, but God is the one you must fear. He's evaluating all of life and he says, God is the one you must fear. Ecclesiastes 8.12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. Catch that one for a moment. Isn't that last line a little redundant? It will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. <laughs> it's like well, you've just told us you're feared to fear. It's maybe emphasis there. This is why it's going to go well for you, is because you're, you're fearful before him in a healthy way. And then the last chapter of Ecclesiastes is chapter 12. And he says, the end of the matter. And now, for men, okay, he's going to talk about 
Solomon in, in Ecclesiastes talks about women, money, and power. He goes into knowledge. He goes into all these topics that would really capture a man's attention. And he says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. When everything is said and done, what it really comes down to is we need to fear God and keep his commandments. You may say, well, wow, you've spent a lot of time in the Old Testament. How about anything in the New Testament? Is there any reason to have to fear God in the New Testament? No, maybe the, maybe the Old Testament's all fear God and the New Testament's all God loves us. As if God changed? As if God hasn't always been working in love? As if discipline, discipline is not an action of love? Typically when we take the Lord's Supper, communion, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we normally will talk about this one section, verses 28 through 30. Let a person examine himself, and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment of himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Every time we take communion, we're normally talking about, you know, before I take this, I need to examine my life again. Is there anything, Lord, that's uh, dividing us? Is there something where I have something against someone else that I need to correct? Is there anything I need to do right now? Because some have become sick and ill and some have died. Galatians 6, 7, I'm thinking about taking the message title from here. Obviously, most people say, what, was, what should be your title of your message? Uh, the fear of the Lord? But I don't know if that's, I, I think this phrase here, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. That phrase scares me. I don't have to be afraid, per se, but it gets my attention that God did not just, it's not this deist mindset that God created everything and is now sitting back in a lounge chair and having some iced tea and just enjoying watching what's happening. I believe God is involved in my daily life. Are you with me on that one? Have you seen God involved in your daily life? Yes, right? Give him credit for that. He's involved in our daily life, which means if we want direction and we're going in the wrong direction, he might have to turn us around. And I'm probably the only one stubborn in this room that it may be, he may have to forcefully turn me around for my own benefit, to do it for me in love. I think every message from now on, I'm supposed to reference my grandchildren. Is that supposed to happen now? Watching my son with his son now is fun. You're loving that too, aren't you? Because... My little grandson is learning to crawl. He's getting ready to walk. And watching my son say he can't do certain things is a very loving thing. I love to see the love my son has for my grandson and giving him direction. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. I think we have to be very careful about being flippant about sin. This whole mindset that, oh, it's a little white lie, cheating on something, inappropriate talk. The bumper sticker that says, Christians aren't perfect, only forgiven. I get what they're saying. And theologically, they're correct. Because once you get saved, you're not perfect. But I'm fearful that people are going to take it to the sense of, well, then it's okay to sin because God's going to forgive me. I know I shouldn't do this, but, but God loves me. He'll forgive me. That's a horrible place to live because God is not mocked. Go back to the zoo with me for a moment. Think about those large cats. They see coming through. Yeah. 
I've watched these tiger trainers and be able to hug a large tiger. I mean, very loving. I, not one of the things on my bucket list. And if it is, it's the last one on my bucket list. <laughs> now, feeding with the cubs and a bottle and play, it sounds fun, but let's realize who God is and the Lord. And again, when I'm saying that, I, I, I'm already making a statement that Jesus is God. Always has been, is, and forever will be God. So thinking of God, I start with a fear that brings love, his mercy, his grace, but serving in worship. Because I realize it's owed to him. He doesn't owe me anything. The only thing he owes me is to keep his word <laughs> of the promises he said. For the person here or who's watching online right now and they're just not sure of even who God is. In Romans 1, we read, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. I'm sorry, but you really can't say I don't believe there's a God and expect to stand before God in all of our sin, stand before God and for him to say, why should I choose my heaven? And to say, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, compared to so-and-so, I'm, I'm, and it's interesting who we compare ourselves to. We, we like to, like, Hitler and some names like that. I, I haven't still heard somebody said, well, compared to Mother Teresa, I'm pretty good. Compared to Billy Graham, I think I'm a pretty good person. I, I haven't heard those as much, right? We like to compare. And definitely no one's saying, well, compared to Jesus Christ, I'm a pretty good person. No. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what we've earned, we've deserved our wages. The separation from God is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you haven't given your life to God, realize you can have that relationship with him, but it's only through Jesus Christ. Why else would he let his son die? It's through Jesus. For those who have given their life to the Lord, I encourage you each day to close off with Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, Father, I want a proper relationship with you and for you. I know I've gone through a number of verses this morning. For people like Jerry Stoff, who are math people, it was 40, I believe, Jerry. <laughs> Went through 40 verses today. <laughs> God's word does not return void. I could come here and talk about the fear of the Lord. My own words would be like, well, I don't know. I still like love sounds better. The verses we went through today, I think you have to understand where Scripture is coming from also, a fear of the Lord. As we close right now, I would like for you to stand with me, please. And if we could put this last verse up, I'm going to let you read it first. And I'd like for us to read it together. But I want you to be able to read it first so you know what you're reading together to make sure you agree with Scripture. You ready with me? Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Let's pray. Father, you are the Almighty One. It's amazing that you are willing to love us, willing to be involved in our daily lives. We thank you for that. We want to look to you constantly. 
an unhealthy fear and receive your love. Your daily love and your love, of, your love that you give in salvation. Father, I pray as we go through the summer series that you again would use your word in a very mighty way and being so practical for our daily lives. Thank you for your patience with us. We love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.